Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Improvisation and Poetry Workshop at Poetry Expo 2024, organized by Versopolis. Uh, I'm uh, Maria Carbonaro. I'm a, a Romanian poet and improviser and cultural anthropologist based in Porto, in Portugal. Uh, and today uh, we're going to be together for one hour uh, discussing a little bit how improvisation helps with poetry practice and vice versa. Uh, I'm going to share this presentation that I prepared. Let me see if it works. Uh, are you seeing the first page? Yes. All right. Um, so uh, just to, to start with uh, what are we going to improvise uh, today? Um, we will have uh, three parts of this session. One that is um, dedicated to how can we awaken more spontaneity in our writing practice using improvisation principles and practices. Uh, this is going to be a bit of sharing from both of my work uh, when I'm using improvisation and poetry in creating learning experiences for people, but also from my personal practice uh, and what I've seen it works and it helps uh, bringing me to life. Um, and then in the second part, we're going to have a series of games and examples of poems that, uh, in my own experience, came out of playing these creative games. Uh, and then at the end, if we have time, we can take some questions from you. All right, so um, maybe in order to understand how I got here and why are we talking about this combination of these two uh, beautiful disciplines today, um, I need to share a little bit of the story behind. Um, so be before living in Porto, I uh, used to live in uh, Romania and in Cluj in Transylvania, um, together with some friends of mine in 2015, we co-created an organization called Education Studio. Uh, and there we, we designed these creative and cultural spaces um, where people can, can experience and can practice skills that we need in life, like creativity and communication. Um, and maybe school didn't um, uh, offer us the possibility to train that so much. And uh, I coordinated Education Studio until 2020. And over these years, I got a chance to meet improvisation theater and spoken word poetry. And it was um, a very strong encounter for me with both of these methods. Um, and I fell in love with them and I brought them to the studio where we created um, two different learning programs for each of them. There were like three months um, of weekly uh, workshops uh, finished with some community events. Uh, one, it was called Actitude, uh, a school of improvisation, and the other one, Conversations, uh, which was related to spoken word poetry. They both had weekly workshops, they both had community events at the end. Uh, and we, we've been doing this for years, and uh, uh, thousands of people from the local community and from the other European countries because uh, we were partners in several international projects, uh, came to, to learn these two methods. Um, and in 2020, I kind of felt like going for something new, for, for a new journey in my life. So I applied to uh, the improvisation school in Calgary, in Canada. Um, there are kind of two uh, epicenters, let's call them, of uh, um, improvisation. One was there in Canada and one was in uh, Chicago um, in the 30s, where Viola Spolin and in Calgary, Keith Johnston, um, two of the mentors that uh, I'm looking up to, um, put together a very consistent methodology of improvisation. So it was like this super amazing 
big dream. And I applied and I got accepted. And it was such a strong, yeah, inspiration that I started to close everything that I, I have uh, built so far in, in Romania. Um, I bought a plane ticket to Canada. I um, uh, paid a fee for the school. I found someone to subrent my room in Cluj. Uh, I closed all my work uh, in the organization and some other, some other, with some other partners. And then pandemic came and I couldn't go anymore. <laughs> and I was faced at that moment with a very um, improvisational choice to either go back to the story that I just closed and reopen the chapter and continue that way or take a, a leap of faith and open a new chapter and jump in the unknown. Um, and I chose the second and that's why I got to Portugal where I thought I'm gonna live here for four months after which I'm gonna go to Canada. Um, we kept in touch with, with our teacher from the school there every month, hoping that it's going to happen next season, next season. Um, the school finally happened uh, last summer in 2023, um, and I didn't go anymore. Um, but what, what happened and, until this moment, um, I can go to the next editions, uh, is that ironically you know how how life is sometimes um i applied to the improvisation school and i had to kind of <laughs> study the same curriculum but with the school of life and over the last three years and a half that i've been here in portugal i i i was faced with with choices and with a big unknown uh, that I had to, rem to to deal with it in some way. And one of the ways that I that I managed to, to deal with all this uncertainty and creating a new story here was asking myself, well, what would I say about this situation in a workshop of improvisation or in poetry? And this question kind of um, sparked my creativity and took me out of... Um, oh my God, I can't do this uh, type of mindset. And I uh, managed to cultivate a new practice of improvisation that also helped with my practice of poetry. So what I'm gonna share today is based mostly of the, on the uh, 14 years of giving workshops with these two methods, but mostly on the last three years and a half where everything that I used to to practice in a, in a safe environment in the training class kind of got polished and tested by, by life. Um, so tonight uh, I'm gonna share a few tools and few ideas that worked uh, for me and that helped in general to deal with the big amount of uncertainty that um, creativity brings. Um, and I chose to, um, uh, to start with, uh, to sum up the, the, the view of what all these years taught me, a quote from Viola Spolin in Improvisation for the Theater, where she says, we learn through experience and experiencing, and no one teaches anyone anything. If the environment permits it, Anyone can learn whatever he chooses to learn. And if the individual permits it, the environment will teach him everything it has to teach. Talent or lack of talent has little to do with it. We must reconsider what we mean by talent. It is possible that what is called talented behavior is simply a greater individual capacity for experiencing. And from this point of view, it is in the increasing of the individual capacity for experiencing that the untold potentiality of a personality can be evoked. And what I like the most about this, this quote is that it helped me shift my focus from questioning, is this poem good or bad? Is this 
did I, have I done the right choice or not to focus on the experiencing and that focus uh, contributed to my creative practice but also to keep some sanity in face of of the uncertainty uh, and that's why I subscribed the um, the project today in the category of Poetry Expo for mental health narratives for poetry and in poetry, because I found these tools um, helping a lot with uh, uh, maintaining sanity in a, in a yeah, changing world. Um, and today I, I chose from, from all this experience three ideas that actually help in a practical way. And the first one, is playing the game. And the, the thing that um, shifting a focus from, okay, and now I'm gonna go to the desk and I'm gonna write this poem and I'm gonna look at the white paper and I hope I'm gonna produce something. The shifting from producing to playing really relaxed and calmed down my nervous system in, in uh, tough moments. And what else it, it, it has done to me on top of this is that it liberated creativity. Because when we're playing the game, what happens in improvisation is that we are bound to the rules of the game. And as long as you respect the rules, you play by the rules, anything else can happen. And that's liberating. Because you can play the game in whatever whatever way you want, as long as you're respecting the rules. So the rules function here kind of like the structure that, that we need in poetry to let ourselves kind of go with the flow, find inspiration and intuition. The other, uh, the other thing that uh, playing the game offers is that um, it gives this opportunity to go beyond self-judgment and to um, not approach us in a violent way, self-sabotaging, uh, because it gives us specific things to evaluate in our writing. Uh, at the end of a writing session, if we're playing the game, the question that we can ask is, did we play the game? Did, did we achieve any, any results? Did we respect the rules? The question is not, uh, is this poem good or bad? Which is a crushing question for a poet, right? Um, and this specificity kind of helps to calm down and to take something from this self-evaluation and move forward to reorganize our mental and emotional resources so we're healthy on the way. Um, and um, a suggestion for, for uh, practicing this principle is first to find a game. And nowadays we have so much, so much access to so much great work. Uh, you can find a game in many improvisation books and websites, but also many creative writing uh, so sources. They have this kind of prompt based uh, type of exercises. But if we don't find anything, I don't think we should get down uh, with it. We can create our, new, our own game. And um, at the beginning, even of uh, a session of 10 or 15 minutes, we can start ourselves with an improvisation game only by choosing one rule. Um, for example, um, write a poem only with words that start with A. That, that sounds crazy, but that can, can trigger your, your creativity. Um, or write a poem only with one word on each line. How would that look like? And this is the, the magic because as long as you're playing the game, it, it also becomes fun. And even if at the, at the end, it's not like the best poem of the world, but at least the time that you spend there, it's good enough to move you forward into the editing process. Um, and I'm, um, I, I wanna make here a note that uh, most of the ideas and practices that I'm gonna share uh, here, they are mostly concerned with the with the first phase of creative practice. I think improvisation works very well for that, um, to release, 
And then it's always in the mindset that we can edit later, whatever comes. Um, and another, um, another suggestion here is to put a timer. This is another good rule. Sometimes when we're writing, it's like, ah, you know, you can, one day you write for five minutes or for a page or for 500 words and one day you can't do anything. So it's so, so in, inhibiting. Uh, but as long as you, you put a five minutes and you play that game for five minutes, then at the end of it, you have something and, and that's enough to move you forward. Um, and to actually see how this works in practice, I want to share with you a poem that I wrote and that came out of playing such a game. And I'm going to read it to you and then we see what type of game do you think I played at the beginning of it, okay? Hmm. The poem is called Under the Palm Tree. Linen hammock, summery air. One lonesome reggae song flying over the palm tree, leaving behind a silky trace of contratempo. I'm here and I don't hear it anymore. The voice of worry. Could you be loved? Took its place. I remember how once my vision was blurry with hurry dust. Where have I been all this time? Mm, nothing, nothing. I, I just imagined my mother getting sometimes as relaxed as this. What kind of child? Would have I be? This was under the palm tree. And I wonder if you can uh, write in the chat or unmute yourself if you have any idea of the rule of the game that I played when this poem got. Um, what was the rule? I was trying to listen to it and I could not find for the life of me a pattern. <laughs> uh -huh. um, but at some point I was thinking if it was uh, based on titles of songs. Uh, but is it? <laughs> it, <No. laughs> it was not, but actually that would make a great rule. That would make a great rule. Wonderful. Um, the rule itself was uh, write two words on the same line. Um, I'm going to share uh, the poem just to have a vision about it. Uh, and also, I, it was interesting for me to see also when I broke the rules. <laughs> and what... Because that's very interesting. When you have a game in improvisation, you also see in which interesting ways can the rules be broken. And for me, for example, when I, I'm, I'm quite chatty and I like words. Uh, that's why I chose poetry and improvisation. So also my rhythm is quite, quite speedy. Um, and writing two words on the same line kind of already gave me this slower pace and the feeling of contratempo that you could find in a reggae song. It was like after reading it, I was I could hear the, the bits, the up and the down of the poem. Um, and I was surprised myself. Like I didn't know that I'm gonna find this while playing the game. Uh, and also here in the part with all this time, it's obviously that it's only one word on the line. There are not two words. Um, and there it was like, I couldn't read that part without making a pause. And silence in that 
in, in that experience became a word itself. Saying, where have I been all this time? It looked like silence actually got a new function in the poem itself. And it was very, yeah, in inspiring and surprising to, to notice that. Thank you uh, for sharing the, the guessing with me. We're going to go on and we're going to have more, more games like this. Um, I'm going to go back to the, to the presentation now. I hope this is, yeah. Uh, the second one, uh, the, the second principle that uh, we train a lot in improv theater and does wonders in poetry as well, is training the senses. And what help, how this helps in, in, in poetry is that um, it encourages the, uh, the person and expression, the connection with my unique way of experiencing something that maybe is general and, and universal. Um, there's this question that haunts us all, like, what do I have to say when, every, when so much has been written, when so much has been, right, portrayed, and there, there are all the movies and the books that, that could have gone out there, uh, why should I write? And I think this principle really helps uh, writers uh, at any stage, but mostly the, the young ones, to find that unique place where we can stand because no, nobody can actually hear the wind in that specific moment of that specific day of that specific place like really you in, in that moment and further on what it does it does it's that it makes uh, uh, it gives the chance for our writing to be specific and to have a rich Im imagery uh, it builds this sensorial vocabulary. And uh, if we're practicing this long enough, instead of uh, writing um, uh, a bird sings in the tree, uh, if we're hearing the same type of the bird, we can understand at one point that maybe it's a, 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 let's say a, a magpie, um, a specific one in an oak tree. Um, and that, that goes while cultivating this this sensorial connectedness. And the connectedness is something that is also very enriching for, for the poet, because sometimes it, it can feel isolated. Um, also, I experienced this uh, during the pandemic, where we got a little bit out of our routines of connecting with people. And how can we feel uh, we are connected and we belong? And this was a question of uh, very powerful for me in my poetry writing um, about belonging while I moved to another country uh, during the pandemic. How can I feel connected? How can I feel this place receives me? Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's fruitful for the mental health to feel that we are breathing together with the same living things that we can hear, that we can see, that we can taste, that we can sense and that we can um, touch. So a few games that help in this direction is to play this game called, what do you hear? Uh, the game is very um, easy to do. You can also self coach yourself into it before a writing session. Um, is you, you're closing your eyes, you're feeling your feet, and then you open up the listening. And what's interesting is that this is automatically calming down because with listening, um, suddenly there's nothing to do. The sounds just find you. <laughs> and you can hear the, the sounds in the room and then you can gradually widen distances and ask yourself, what, what do I hear from the street outside? Then what do I hear three streets far from here? What do I hear one kilometer far from here? Uh, what do I hear 500 kilometers, 10,000 kilometers? And even though it's like somebody could say, come on, you cannot, you cannot hear that far, uh, the imagination 
awakens during this this question and uh, you actually <laughs> what happens for some of us is that you can actually hear more things that you believe you can hear that's one of them uh, another game that we can play is uh, we call it five things uh, you can go to a place and name five things you hear five things you see five things you touch five things you smell and five things you can taste and then you can list them and that could make a very rich body for a for a poet for a poem later on Another interesting game to play is to associate elements from two senses. And what's even more playful is to associate things that you would never put together, right? Like the smell of uh, a shawarma with the, I don't know, um, the, the sound of a classical music and Mozart and see what, what that can, can bring to you. Um, and I play these games myself and I would like to read now something that came out of it. Uh, and this poem um, came out actually when I was on a volcanic island um, where I've seen an interesting character and I'm gonna read it to you the poem is called The Village Fool Listen to the song nesting inside the crater and you'll hear about the crazy lad living inside the blue tottering walls at the base of the volcano. His bulky shredded jeans and schemes made out of crooked hands and twisted knees make village kids remember the other night's bad dreams. But only the first time they met him. For soon they learn Bernardo is not harmful. He's living among us, as he is. Marching up and down towards the football field, clattering a large ring filled up with croaky keys. And you, curious at nature games, gaze at the sun rays falling on the ditch and you see Bernardo's mother doing her first childbearing mistake that left him crucified like this. Or you see the open arms of the midwife waiting at the entrance for a brown boy blanketed in blood, legs first. Or you see the father coming back that night from the rowdy tavern, sharing a common wall with the town hall, met by some small large eyes that disturb him back into senses and hits daddy's little chump with a cheap bottle of wine. Or, gazing at the sun rays, you start to see the fool. Doubts creeping out to ask if his insanity is true. Because sometimes he seems to see far more clear than you. The times you dare to look, you meet him and you find he's not living among us. He's living inside. Now, back to you, uh, what game or games do you think have been at the root of this poem? And I want to mention that all the poems that I'm going to read today, uh, they went through a process of editing. So uh, it's an unrealistic expectation to think that we're going to play a game and now pff, it's going to uh, come out in a, in, a in a form that we don't want to work on anymore. This is not the message that I want to transmit. None of the poems that I'm reading today um, are like this, but started like this. Yeah, so now coming back, what, what rules do you envision? Hmm. So are, is this game related to the census? I mean, uh, are we in this part or is it not related to this? It is. I think... Uh, from from my side, yes, it is related. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, could you maybe show the poem uh, so that I can see the words? Uh-huh. I can uh -huh. see maybe I can uh, I can break the yes. 
break the code. <laughs> Do you see now? I see it now, yeah. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. All I notice is that there's a lot of um, locations that are mentioned. Uh, or like setting apart distances from where something is and where something is happening. Mm. That's a nice lead. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's my best guess, but mm -hmm. yeah. Actually it's um uh, the the locations that you mentioned is part of what I saw being there. Mm -hmm. Uh I was playing the five things. On the island, what do I hear? What do I taste? What do I see? Um, mm. And one one of the strongest presence that I've seen on the island was the presence of, of uh, this this person that I met. Uh, the way he walked, the way he talked, the way he looked, it was all mm -hmm. very strong. Uh, not all five from five senses got into the poem, but it 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 started like that. And another. Yeah, another game that is on top of the senses here. It's a game in improv, we call it, I mean, it goes under many names, but we call it before and after. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, like, you make this observation about um, an, an object or a character that you see, and then you try to play in your mind and to see how what happened before that it got there. And what could come after? And uh, for me, all these scenarios were kind of imaginary possibilities of what happened before that that this person um, uh, became like this. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you for your options. It's uh, it's so interesting to kind of look back now <laughs> mm. through, and through your guessing. It was very, very inspiring. Um, all right. Um, let's go to the third one, huh? Ah, not this one. This one, yeah? Okay. So um, the third one is, uh, I call it postponing the editing. <laughs> And this is one of the things that keep us from improvising the most is that um, uh, we're kept um, <laughs> from getting to the intuitive knowing, to, to the creativity, to the river spontaneity by this continuous question is, is this good or bad? And will I be approved if I'm thinking this or if I'm saying this? And that's kind of staying uh, between us and the, the creative stream. Um, this happens in poetry as well as in improvisation. Uh, Viola Spalling calls it the approval disapproval syndrome. That this constant question like, um, what is the authority saying about that and how can I gain the, the, the acceptance. Um, and even if we are in the room with a figure of authority or not, even if we are writing by ourselves, these voices are still there, keeping editing. Uh, how, how, can I, how can you write that? How can you, um, who, would, who would say that? This is, this is so cliche. Um, this has been written a thousand times before you, you know, the, 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 the voices, that filter. And what um, the deal that I got to, <laughs> to make, to be able to improvise in the first stage of creation in my poetry writing is to make this pact that we're gonna have a spot for you afterwards. Now we're improvising um, and we're going intuitively and then we can measure and trimming and adapting. 
And this kind of deal, in, internal deal, liberate, rib, liberates the practice. Um, and it also uh, remembers us that we can play, you know? Well, I, I feel like in, uh, in my life and in the workshops that I'm doing, uh, we get so serious sometimes and I'm getting some serious and there are um, legitimately serious topics that we are writing about in poetry. Uh, what happens is that that weight sometimes needs to be balanced with lightness so we can bring those topics out and talk about them and share them uh, in a connected way in a public space. So playing a game and allowing us to improvise, what, what offered uh, to me and what offers is that it gives some lightness also when when dealing with serious topics in poetry. And when I'm saying lightness, it's not like we're ignoring what is actually happening. It's more a way of breathing and, and uh, making space for more things to uh, show themselves in the space, in our writing or in our improvisation practice. And, um, few uh, ideas, few recommendations for, for practicing this deal with uh, going a bit woo, <laughs> funky with, uh, with the text. And this maybe applies after you have written something from the previous games, is to take a piece uh, that, that we wrote and just read it for ourselves. Only the reading part, hearing our voice, uh, putting, putting um, sound on the written text uh, has some sort of liberation of energy. Then what we can do is to play with it. Um, we can, while saying, you know, there's nobody there. We can, we can make a rap, we can change words, we can repeat words, we can stop in the middle of the word, we can sing some parts, we can move some parts. We can add styles uh, of uh, different music genres, for example, to some parts. We can read it in um, portraying different voices from our family or friends, like how would mom read that or how would this funny friend of mine read that? Um, and there is some kind of change that occurs during this process. And we can take that uh, what what uh, arose from the improvisation itself and come back to the text and adapt it. And usually what uh, it does is that it brings fluidity and authenticity to the voice. Because once you spoke a thing in your own voice, it's like, ah, oh, this actually sounds more, more like me, more natural. Why am I using this uh, fancy word? I don't talk like that. So it brings back natural scene. Um, and for that, I would like to actually, uh, read something, but like playing the game together now, like with you. Um, and I'm going to share already, you can see already the poem that I'm going to read. We can, I don't know, play with it, improvise a bit. So this is a poem that actually started from um, from the game what do you hear and i was hearing the sounds in my room and then i was hearing sounds further away and then i heard this um, sound from a forest nearby where i used to go during the pandemic a lot and in the last i keep going there and whenever i go there i could I could feel that <laughs> I'm bringing some the city intellectual energy and the forest is, is uh, responding, you know, because the space is super calm. There are very few people that pass, pass by that space and maybe a few dogs. And one day I could actually see myself like I was coming in, in this marching way, uh, stamping with my feet. And then I heard quite far inside of the forest when I was at the entrance, this sound. And I just, and then more sounds like this. And I just realized 
the birds were actually like, whoa, we, we got to run. <laughs> um, and it was a kind of a dialogue, a conversation that I understood. And reminding that during the, playing the game, what do you hear? Um, part of this poem came. And I, um, because I'm also trying to learn Portuguese in this period, uh, and it's always a question of translation and of in which language should I write when I'm writing. I just put all of uh, three of them, um, the Portuguese language and the Romanian language. Uh, the, the original poem is in Romania, but I translated it in English and Portuguese. So maybe we're gonna play a little bit with it just to see how it's. Through the damp, cold air, prin aerul umed și rece, Luar umidui friu, through the damp cold air, five leaves are falling at the same time. Cinci frunze cad în același timp. În același timp, cinco folhas caem o mesmo tempo. O mesmo tempo, out of the dripping time in which they fell. Do afogamento no tempo em que caíram. Din timpul galeata în care au căzut. O coțofană pica-pica, o pica-pica magpie, uma pega-pica-pica, voa com rapidez em direção um carvalho. Em direção um carvalho. Fly swiftly towards an oak tree. Zboară iute spre un stejar. Fly swiftly towards an oak tree. I am the only ball of noise. Sou a única bola de ruído. 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 Scomot. Sunt singurul gem de zgomot. Sunt singurul gem de zgomot din pădure care nu cântă în același ton. I'm the only ball of noise in the forest that doesn't sing in tune. In the forest that doesn't sing in tune. So o unica bolă de ruid în floreste că nu cântă în sintonia cu un violin și un contrabaș. In tune with the violins and the double bass. The violins and the double bass. În ton cu viorile și cu contrabasul. Dacă am fi o orchestră, If we were an orchestra, să fosim un orchestra, if we were an orchestra, I'd be the gong of the mind. Eu seria o gong de mente, aș fi gongul minții, upon which the percussionist carelessly stumbled, de care te-am piedicat neglijent percussionistul. Eu seria o gong de mente în că o percussionistă trupsă pur neglijentia. A memory embraces me from behind, uma memoria Abraça-me por atrás. Ou a mentira me embraçasse de lá espate. A memory embraces uma memória. Ou a mentira a memory embraces me. Uma memória abraça-me. A memory embraces me. Ou a mentira me embraçasse de lá espate. Cá atunci que não me engropat frunza lá solstício. When I buried the leaf at the solstice, at the solstice, no solstício, at the solstice, lá solstício, no solstício. Como enterei quando enterei a folha no solstício, at the solstice. And I wished that for a moment, e me andorit, cá dentro o clipa, for a moment, por um momento, for a moment, this earth, pamento lá está, esta terra. Pământul ăsta să-mi primească rădăcinile și să pot cânta. Would receive my roots and I could sing. Would receive my roots and I could sing. Ește terra, răsăbește își mine aș raiză și eu pute să cântar. And I could sing. And I could sing. Și să pot cânta în același rit. And I could sing. And I could sing. And I could sing. Eu pute să cântar. And I could sing. Eu pute să cântar. And I could sing in tune. Și să pot cânta în același rit. And I could sing in tune. Eu pute să cântar au son. Du pica pica. Wonderful. <laughs> wow. It was really nice how you um, so, uh, simultaneously read the poem in all three languages. Uh, it mm -hmm. was very not... Um, it you, you have such nice flow. It like flows from one language to the next and it's very natural. Um, so that was really... Wow. <laughs> Mm. Mm. Thank you.